house is. Uh, my name is John and this is my wife Linda. And we're here to tell you why it's so important to us to worship together as a congregation. Well, during the pandemic, it was really hard for both of us to not be in church, inside the sanctuary, because uh, we look at the sanctuary as God's house. It's a special place, it's a sacred place, and it is a place where you find peace and you find refuge. You kind of uh, forget about the past week, and you don't have any distractions and the busyness of your life disappears and you focus in on God's Word. And I think it's important too that when you're in the sanctuary, you see the reactions of other people to around, around you. And I think that that embellishes the service, at least for me it does. And as far as the music, you can hear music, you can hear religious music anywhere. But in the sanctuary, that music, and especially our choir, and Rodney at the organ, or Terry at the organ, or other musicians, that music surrounds you. I mean, it surrounds your whole body. You feel it vibrating, I think, inside of you. I feel it in my heart and my soul, and that just cannot be uh, repeated listening to music uh, just with your ears. You need to hear it with your whole soul. You know, it, it's interesting because uh, we sit in the last row and we've been accused of uh, different reasons for sitting in the last row. One is if uh, Sean's sermon goes long, we could sneak out. Guys that are my age figure it's because I want to be closer to the bathroom. But there's a real reason why we sit in the back. And that's because we could take in the full breath of the community of Christians worshiping together. And it, it brings such a fulfillment to be there with uh, people. We see couples looking at each other and smiling when something is said during the sermon that they relate to. We see people putting their arms around each other and, and listening to the service. We see young children maybe that have gotten up a little earlier than they want, leaning their head against their parent's shoulder. It's all a matter of sharing God with everyone else. Communion is special. It's an individual thing between uh, uh, us and our God, but it's more special when you see everybody taking it together. And the same thing with the singing. There's nothing that is more fulfilling than when we sing uh, our, uh, our Father at the end of the service. And so that's really why we sit in the back. It just mm -hmm. adds to the uh, enjoyment of community worship. And we don't leave early. We sit and wait for Terry or Rodney to finish their music. And you know, people come in individually, but at the end of the service, they walk out together. And there's another opportunity for ministry, just asking somebody, how are things going? Uh, those are all things that you get by worshiping together. And, and, and that's why uh, we love coming to church. And two, as we approach the Advent season, I think it's important. We all know the story of, of Jesus' birth, but each time you hear it, depending upon what's going on in your life at the time, you may hear something different, and it may be just enough to make a difference in your life and uh, renew your soul and your heart. So uh, please come to worship here at Crestview. And uh, when you decide to do that, stop by and say hello to John and me. We'll look forward to it. One other thing I want to say, if you feel uncomfortable sitting in the congregation and uh, us watching you, the thing is, you got to realize that God's watching all of us and he's smiling. and John, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. The back pew every Sunday and uh, good Presbyterians, that's where uh, good Presbyterians sit apparently. As you can see, the front pews are just teeming with people down here. Yeah. All right, welcome everyone. It's great to see you. If you're our guest this morning, we are just so glad that God has called you into this place to uh, join together in worship. If you would uh, like to know anything about this church, 
there are so many ways that you can uh, contact us, and you can certainly go to our website or just call the church office, but um, we'd be happy to answer any questions. If you think, uh, I really feel like God is calling me to be a part of this place, those are conversations I really love to have. So if you uh, are feeling that, feel free to reach out to me, and I'd be happy to have it with you. Uh, welcome to those of you who are online. We are thrilled you're with us. Today is Communion Sunday. Uh, we can all see it here in the, in the sanctuary, but if you uh, have a moment, go and get your communion elements, and we will celebrate the sacrament later. As always, uh, we encourage you to check in. Let us know that you're here, and any request you might have or issue you might be having, we'd love to uh, help you with that. Beyond the bulletin, that's how we stay in touch, and of course during Advent there's a lot of different things going on, and love to uh, have you sign up for that if you already haven't. I learned last night that this is Terry McKibben's 18th anniversary as organist at Crestview Presbyterian Church. <laughs> that is awesome. Think about how many Green Bay Packers games you've played during over the years, a lot of them. But uh, I guess you've seen a lot over the years, and 18 years, but uh, just well done. And uh, our longest tenured staff member. Uh, it, well, you're a joy, so thank you for that. Um, after the uh, worship service today, we have a reception down in the fellowship hall, so that's down this hallway, for uh, Sarah Jane Nixon and Nathan and their son Alexander. Uh, Pastor Sarah Jane will be up here in a moment, and uh, you'll have a chance to meet her and meet her entire family after, um, after the service. So, anyway, speaking of Pastor Sarah Jane, I'd like to invite you to come up here and join me if you would. First of all, welcome. Thank you. We are so thrilled and delighted to have you here, and um, that's the hot seat over there, so I moved <laughs> over here. Hey, we were thinking about some things that we, uh, we just really need to know about Pastor Sarah Jane, and so I've just got a couple questions. But first of all, um, after saying welcome, how about just telling us a little bit about yourself, you know, just some biographical information and stuff like that. Yeah, so I kind of grew up bouncing around the deep south, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina. Uh, my father was a uh, pastor and my mother was a, is a teacher. Uh, so we, you know, every four or five years uh, moved around a little bit. So, uh, but the name, Sarah Jane, double named, other double southern name. Yeah, that's, why. that's lovely. Yeah. So you prefer Sarah Jane? Sarah Jane. Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Not Sarah, gotcha. And uh, coming here from the mountains of southwestern Virginia. Awesome. And uh, coming very close to my mother. So insofar as home is where your mother is. Yeah. I'm, uh, oh, that's exciting. Home. She's down in Versailles, yeah. right? She's in Versailles. Woodford County. So college? Davidson College okay. in North Carolina, and yeah. then seminary at Princeton Seminary in gotcha. New Jersey, which is a different world from the Deep South, I'll Yes, it is, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I was thinking about your bio and wondering, is there anything like a fun fact about you that wouldn't necessarily be in your bio? Because we've read about you, but let's hear the, uh, let's hear the fun fact. Fun fact. The, the go-to fun fact is that I'm a triplet. I've got okay. two brothers yeah. and me. Wow. And, uh, you know, people always, you know, with two brothers and one girl, how did that go? It went really well. They were at each other's throat, but they kind of spoiled me. <laughs> Left so. you alone. That's yeah. great. Now, where do they live? Uh, one of my brothers is in med school at UK, so okay. he lives in Lexington. And my other brother is a science teacher in Aiken, South Carolina. Gotcha. And, um, you know, we, I guess I'm thinking about what do you like to do, you know, when you're not at work? You know, what are your interests and your hobbies? What do you all do for fun? Together, we do. Th we like to go to concerts when you know we don't have a small a small boy yep. uh, who would not like a concert. No, um, I know some big ones who don't either. That's <laughs> another story. <laughs> and uh, I like personally uh, fish tanks. I like to. Um, really? I like fish. I like aquatic plants. So I like to grow uh, aquatic plants and put fish to decorate the plants. Okay. Yeah. So if you if you come visit me in my office, there's a shrimp you can eat. And so those are aquatic plants. I thought you just hadn't cleaned the uh, aquarium. <laughs> those aquatic plants in there. Okay. Interesting. Uh, we need to get what's some really important information now. Uh, favorite food? Sushi. Wow, I didn't see that coming. Sushi. Sushi makes me happy. <laughs> Rodney, you're not a sushi guy. Should we ask her what her favorite donut is? 
Favorite donut? <laughs> maple glazed. Ooh, maple glazed. Do you like a little bacon on there? I've never had bacon oh, nice. on there, but You're I'd welcome be open, to Cincinnati. We have a, to try it. All right, th th this is it. The last question. This is the most, <laughs> the most important question for Pastor Sarah Jane to consider. What is your favorite football team? Football is what happens on the marching band field sometimes. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? <laughs> Football is what happens in the marching band field sometimes, I think. That's true, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't even know what to say to that. I mean, who's your favorite football team? You know, you like football, I'm sure. Well, the APNC informs me that Alexander is a fan of the Bengals. He is for now. Well, there's plenty of time. <laughs> Wait till he's lived here for a while. Um, so you don't like football? It's not my thing. Well, what do you talk about in your sermons if you don't like football? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my, well, welcome. We are so thrilled that, uh, that y'all are with us and look forward just to years and years together and serving the Lord. And so uh, you'll have a chance to uh, really find out the scoop about Pastor Sarah Jane during the uh, reception. So... Thank you so much. I'll let you, head, Thank you head back down. Uh, well, now let's uh, prepare our hearts for worship and just kind of take a deep breath. And uh, this morning we uh, will meditate on Psalm 88, verse 8, and pray it back to God. So let's go to Him in prayer. O oh Lord God Almighty, who is like you? You are mighty, O Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. O Lord God Almighty, who is like you? You are mighty, O Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. Gracious God, we bow before you, the creator of the universe, the sovereign God of all, and we praise you for your great power this morning. And Lord, as we meditate on your word, we thank you that your faithfulness does indeed surround you, that there is no place where you are not faithful. And we recognize what that means for us. We thank you that in spite of all of our flaws and failures, you remain faithful. We thank you that when we are not faithful, you remain faithful to us. And so Lord God, we pray today that you accept our gratitude and our praise. May you be blessed as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Nathan and Pastor Sarah Jane, I'd like to invite you to come forward now and begin our service. They will not... They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. We are the followers of that root of Jesse Isaiah spoke of. We are the ones who are now called to stand as a signal to the world, to all of creation, that peace is the will of the one who created us. Peace is the knowledge of the Lord that we proclaim from sea to shining sea. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near, and bear fruit worthy of repentance. We light these candles, the candle of joyful hope and the candle of proclaimed peace, in part to remind ourselves that we are the people rising towards God's promise. But we also light them as a sign to the world, an announcement there are some who hold on to the hope, there are some who work the ways of peace. We stand as a sign that Emmanuel is still our fervent prayer.
Oh, amen, and thank you as always for leading our worship. You know, I was thinking maybe I would, uh, I think I'll leave this chair right here. If anyone falls asleep out there, I'll invite you to come sit right here during the sermon, all right? So I got my eyes going on all of y'all. I, uh, I'm having trouble concentrating because I keep thinking football is what happens on the marching band field. So, see, I can't let that go. So anyway, I got to work on that. <laughs> I am outnumbered for sure. I know it. You know, recently uh, we've had a, a number of uh, funerals and memorial services here. And I've had several people say to me, that one of the things that we enjoy about a memorial service or a funeral service is that we learn so much about the person who has passed on. I mean, have you ever had that experience that you go to a memorial service, you're like, I had no idea any of these things about this person. I've known them for years. I mean, I remember learning that someone once had lived in New Zealand at their funeral. And I thought, had I known they lived in New Zealand, I would have loved to have heard that story. Or someone who fought in the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. And as I heard that, I wondered, I spent so much time with him, I wish I could have known that so that we could have talked about it. Because I was curious about it. And so as I've thought about that, and I've heard some of you say that, one of the things I'm working on in my life is slowing down. Because I am always in a hurry. Y'all, we all know that. I'm always in a hurry. I've always got somewhere to go. Even if I don't have anywhere to go, I've got somewhere to go. And so, because we've got to go, you know, we've got to go. We've got to keep moving. And um, I'm really working on just kind of slowing down and enjoying relationships. And so this past week, I thought I have only one appointment on the calendar all afternoon. I'm going to drive to where one of our church members is in rehab from surgery. It's a long way away, and I am going to just sit there and enjoy that person, and when she's ready for me to leave, I'll leave. And so I got to the place where she was, and we were sitting there talking, and just having a great conversation. She's 92 years old, and so I have to bear in mind, I've only known her since she was 86. So she had a long life before that, you know? And so I'm asking her, I'm sa I said, tell me about yourself. Just tell me about your life. And so she started talking about all these different things that she had done, and in my mind, she is this tall and a sweet little grandmother. And she said, but you know, one of the things I really enjoyed was in 1970, I decided, even though we had a, a young child, that I would go to ground school. Now, does anyone know what ground school is? I had no idea. I was thinking like gardening or agriculture. No, ground school is where you learn about aviation. And so she decided, I'm 42 years old, it's 1970, I'm really interested in aviation. And so she started going to ground school. And then she went home one evening after a few times at ground school, and she said to her husband, I'd like to get my pilot's license. And he said, go for it. And so I'm thinking, I cannot believe this person wanted to get her pilot's license. She said, Sean, it was 1970. There were only 9,900 women in the entire country who had their pilot's license. I was a 42-year-old with no military experience, and I decided I want to learn how to fly a plane. And so she did. And I said, well, did you ever fly the plane by yourself? And she said, of course, I flew by myself all the time. I flew all over the country. She said, I used to love to fly to northern Ohio to visit my mom and dad. They lived on a farm. And they would hear my plane coming, and they would stand out in the yard, and they would wave handkerchiefs at me. And then she said there was an airstrip about a mile away, out in the middle of nowhere, and I would land on this tiny little airstrip, and I mean my mouth, the jaw's on the floor. I would land on this tiny little airstrip, and I would have to circle it really low to shoo the pigs off of it so I could land the plane. And I've just been blown away. I am standing there or sitting there in, in complete amazement because I would have never guessed that about her. I mean, I was thinking, I can't imagine her, this tiny little grandmother, by herself in a plane, shooing pigs off of a runway, circling it in this airplane. I mean, I'm happy when I back out of the driveway and don't hit a trash can, you know? <laughs> and I thought about, after our conversation... Had someone said this to me about her, I would have never believed it. 
But hearing it from her own lips was such a powerful thing. Think about that this morning. Because what we're going to do is look at a passage from the Revelation of Jesus Christ, the book of Revelation, the Revelation of John. And it is something you don't think about, the book of Revelation during Christmas. But what we're going to see is Jesus Christ is giving us a first-hand, first-person account of who He is. We are hearing it straight from His lips. So as you know, it was written by John the Apostle. John the Apostle wrote, of course, the Gospel according to John. He wrote three short epistles in the New Testament, and then he also wrote this book called The Revelation of John, or The Revelation of Jesus. The Gospel of John was written so that the people would believe. The letters were written so that the people would be faithful. And Revelation was written so that the people would be prepared. John was an interesting story. Late in his life, all the other apostles had been executed, essentially, for their faith. And yet only John remained. It was a time of incredibly intense persecution of the church. Nero, we've talked about him, total madman, gave way to Domitian, who continued the persecution of the church. And so, of course, all these apostles had been, like I said, executed, except for John. And so the order for his execution was sent out. But by divine intervention, he wasn't executed. And as an 85-year-old, he was sent to Patmos, which is an island about 10 miles by 6 miles, 50 miles off the coast of Turkey. Not a lot of vegetation there. And so he's all by himself on this island. And then as he was there, God gave him this revelation. It's interesting that about 10 years after he had been placed there, when he was 95 years old, he was brought back to the mainland, to Asia Minor, and he was essentially freed. And the stories that are told by the early church is that when he was a very elderly person, the churches would invite him to come and just be among the believers. Can you imagine? You were there with the Apostle John, who knew Jesus intimately, who said he was Jesus' favorite disciple. And so he would sit there with the congregation, and he was so elderly and so weak that he could no longer stand and teach so he would just sit in a chair, and in a very quiet, feeble voice, he would say, little children, love one another. That was it. For him, that was the core of the gospel. And so this morning, I want to look at some of the things that he said. We're just going to take chapter 1 as it comes. And I know that when you and I think about this book, The Revelation of John, we think about all the imagery, and I'm, I want to get into that sometime. In fact, as I was studying this, I thought, we got to do a series on that. So we'll do that maybe in the next year or so. We'll talk about that and figure out when. But what I want to do now is just get into it and look at what we learn about Jesus Christ. Remember, we are calling this, Come and Behold Him. And so my prayer is that as you and I look at this, we're just simply going to behold the Lamb and just appreciate Him for what he has told us about himself. So remember, it was written during a time of persecution. And so here you go. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants what must soon take place. The revelation of Jesus Christ. This isn't what John discovered. It's what Jesus revealed about himself. Big difference there. Essentially, Jesus comes to him and says, this is exactly who I am. This is firsthand information and God gave it to him you know there's a powerful impact when we hear something from a person's mouth or from a person's lips right think about in a court of law a an eyewitness testimony has much greater significance and weight than secondhand or hearsay or conjecture right I mean if someone says to you you know so-and-so told me they're really upset about something you've got that information if you go to so-and-so and say, hey, I hear you're really upset, they might say, you know, I'm just kind of confused, didn't really understand, really understand, and here's why. You know, there's just a difference there. What Jesus Christ wants you and me to know is this is what he says about himself. And I want to note this, what soon must take place. Note that when you and I read it's going to take place soon, we think, all right, in a few days, a few months, and a few years, 
But that's not really a good translation. It's kind of unfortunate. Because in the Greek, this concept is from the Greek word in taxi. We get the word tachometer from it. It doesn't mean soon. It means rapidly, quickly, or fast. What we're seeing here is Jesus is saying, when the day comes that I will return, the events are going to happen very, very fast. It's not going to be slow and it's not going to be gradual. And so we move on. Verse 3. I love this. Pretty interesting. If you read the New Testament or read the Old Testament, is there any other book that says, if you read this, you will be blessed? I can't find that. Yet we get this claim by Jesus. If you read this book, what's going to happen? Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, and take it to heart because the time is near. And as I read that, think about that as an outline for how you and I study Scripture. What do we do? What is God calling us to when we get into His Word? Well, we read it. We take time. We go to the book. We open it, and we see what God has to say. And then we hear it. We comprehend it. We understand it. We study it. And then what do we finally do? We take it to heart. We internalize it. We trust it and obey it. I think that's essentially what he's saying here. That's how you and I are to approach God's Word. Read, hear, take it to heart. And then he reiterates the time is near. And rather than being um, repetitive, I want to say what occurred to me when I read this for a second time is that the time is near for all of us, isn't it? I mean, no matter how old we are or how, how healthy we are, our tomorrow is never guaranteed on this earth. It just didn't. We only have right now. And so the time for you and me to behold Him is today because the time is near. All right, we're almost done with the introduction. Verses 4 and 5, we continue on. Grace and peace to you. Interesting. That's the way He greets them. It's not like He's saying, hey, or howdy, or yo. It's very intentional here. Grace and peace to you. Grace, that is a Greek word, which means God's favor. That is a Greek greeting. Peace, that is a Hebrew greeting, right? Shalom, to be whole, to be well, to be intact. What he's saying here is, this is good news you're about to hear. The readers might be thinking, you know, I don't know what this is going to be all about. But John is making sure they know this is not a word of woe. He doesn't start out with woe to you, does he? Grace and peace to you. He doesn't start out with, we got to talk. By the way, has anyone ever said that to you? We need to talk. I mean, even as I say that right now, I can feel my blood pressure increasing. You know, don't you just hate to hear that? We need to, that's not the tone of this letter, is it? No. Grace and peace to you. And then we get the Trinity. From Him who is and was. That's a designation of the Father and is to come. And from the seven spirits before His throne. Isn't that interesting? What are the seven spirits? Do we ever think of the Holy Spirit as seven? Or is it something else? So as we do when we study the Bible together, we think, okay, where else can I find some information about this? And so my study took me to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, because we see the seven ministries of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon Him. The Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, of counsel and power, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So we have a seven-fold ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so this is merely an affirmation of that. So we have the Father, we have the Spirit, and then of course we have Jesus Christ. And here's what I want to do for these next few minutes, is just behold what He says about Himself. First of all, He is what? The faithful witness. What does that say to you and me about who Jesus is? He's the faithful witness. He's telling us this about himself. Well, as I think about that, here's what occurs to me. When you and I see him, we see God. And I'm always curious when I hear folks say, you know, Jesus was just kind of another religious leader. You know, there are a lot of them out there. There is no one else in the history of this planet that when you see him or her, you see God. He is the faithful witness witness every once in a while you might hear a child say what does God look like and of course we don't know exactly how to answer that question but here's what's really interesting to me the New Testament writers never describe Jesus's appearance do they 
me. Meditate on that with me. Do you know what he looks like? Do I know what he looks like? You know, in the Bible, we read about people who are tall and not so tall, with beards, with no hair, with a limp. We learn about the personal characteristics and physical characteristics of people in the Bible. We get nothing about Jesus Christ. Why would that be? Why wouldn't we get this information about what he looks like? The only thing I can take from that is it doesn't matter. Because when we look at who he was, we see the heart and the will of God. We don't know what he looks like, but we knew what it, do know what he thinks. And so we just sit back and behold him. When we look at him, we look at God. What else is he? He is the firstborn from the dead. Interesting phrase, isn't it? Firstborn is a Greek concept that refers to birth order in this case. It's not a figure of speech. This is a real description. Jesus was the one who would inherit the, the estate from the Father. That's what happens. So he's the firstborn in terms of birth order, also from the dead, and that refers to his bodily resurrection. Now we know that there are other people who were dead that were resurrected. Hello, Lazarus, right? But Jesus is the first one who gets this spiritual body. When we look at him and behold him and think about his resurrection, you and I are seeing what's going to be true for you and I someday. And me someday. And what I also note is, is he, is he the only child here? No. He's just the firstborn. And so what that implies is that you and I, again, will be among those who are resurrected. And then finally, one more thing he says about himself. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He has authority over everything. You know, there are places on this planet where there are despotic rulers who forbid any kind of Christianity whatsoever. And you know what's happening in those places? The church is flourishing. Jesus is taking people out of that ruler's kingdom for his own kingdom. He is over everything. He is over all. And so that tells me the way I watch the news shouldn't be with any kind of fear whatsoever. He's over all those folks. And so we behold Him. This is who He is. All right, continue on, verses 5 and 6. As I was reading this, and we've only got one more screen after this, and I know we're going long, but let's just do it. As I was reading this, here's what I wanted to think about with you. What does God think about you? And what does He think about me? I will tell you that personally, over my life, I have battled the notion that God is disappointed in me. Have you, can you identify with that? That, you know, Sean, you just haven't used the gifts I've given you. You've not been faithful with those gifts, and I've given you so many opportunities and resources, and you've been too afraid. And for those of us who kind of wonder what God really thinks about us, you get a personal message from Jesus himself, who loves us <laughs> and has freed us from our sins by his blood. That's what he says to me, I love you. You know, you might think, you know, does the President of the United States love you? No. Does the Governor? No. The Mayor? No. Do, you know, Senators? No. Does the server at Waffle House? No. Who loves you, really? He does. And how do we know what's the evidence? Has freed us from our sins, how? By his blood, sacrifice, and made us to be a kingdom, and made us priests, to serve as God and Father, to him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. You know, I think sometimes we can get caught up in the sentimentality of Advent and Christmas. Now, I love to sit and stare at the Christmas tree and stare at the Christmas lights, but we've got to remember we are beholding the one who died in our place and made a way for us to enter into the presence of God and to have a relationship with Him. And then finally, verse 7. I almost didn't include this because it feels kind of like um, kind of hanging on at the end, but it's just something that I, I want to do. So, look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. So this is um, an allusion to the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're starting to learn what that's going to be like, and there's something here that's important to us. We could do an entire sermon on this. He's coming with the clouds. Note, he's not coming in the clouds. You know, we're not, we're not looking up and, and thinking, okay, I'm going to see him in a cirrus or a stratus or a cumulus. There he is. Yeah, I can see his face. No. He's coming with the clouds. What does that mean? I'll tell you where my mind goes. Think about Hebrews chapter 12. 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. He will come with His people someday. He will come with those who have gone on before us, that great cloud of witnesses. And it's going to be different this time. Who was there on that first night of His incarnation? You got mom and dad. And then you get a few shepherds. And later you get some angels and some wise men. Who will see Him when He comes back for good? And every eye shall see Him, everyone. And so this morning, we just sit back and we behold Him, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the resurrection, the ruler of the kings of the earth who loves us, who died for us, and who will one day come again. And so friends, let's behold Him. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. And the scripture tells us that in the kingdom of heaven, they will come from east and west and north and south to sit at table. And this is a foretaste of that table. So don't come to this table out of tradition, or obligation, or guilt, or because it's just the next thing that happens in the worship service. Come because the Lord Jesus Christ invites you to this table. Come because here you will see him as he is and recognize him. Because here you will hear God say to you, not death, but life. Not guilt, but redemption. Not an enemy or a stranger, but his own child. Let us pray. Lord our God, in your word you tell us that all of creation sings your praise. In heaven, the angels and the archangels and the prophets and the martyrs and the saints who have gone before us. And here on earth, the stars and the mountains, and you say the rocks themselves, if we do not praise you. But we have more reason to praise you than they do. Because unlike all the rest, you have made us in your image and likeness. And above all, above all, because you have sent us your Son, Jesus Christ, to come and redeem us from the slavery of sin that no other creature could have freed us from. We give you thanks because in him you have brought light where there was only darkness and life where there was only death. That in him you showed us mercy when we could do nothing but rebel against you. Lord, as we come to this table, we know that we are not worthy of it. We know our sins. That we have failed to love as you have commanded us to love. 
that we have often given ourselves to unbelief or to malice or to laziness. And those things we name before you now in silence. But as we confess these things to you, we also confess that you are a merciful God, a loving Father, who is more eager to hear and forgive than we are to confess. And so despite these things, we have the courage to present ourselves here at this table to receive your grace and to proclaim to the world that here we have found freedom and life, that here in Jesus Christ we have found your favor, that here in Jesus Christ we are your children and heirs. True to his command, we come to proclaim his death until he comes again. And we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit among us so that as we eat and drink, we would also eat and drink the assurance of your love and of eternal life in him. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And having given thanks for it, he broke it. And gave it to his disciples. And said, take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? And the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace and generosity in feeding us through your word and through this sacrament. And we pray that what we have received from your hand would sustain us on our journey to you and in eternal life. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
let's go meet the uh, Nixon family down in the uh, Fellowship Hall. And be but before we do, friends, go in peace, go in the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit. May the Lord be with you today and forever. Amen.